Life is full of pivotal beginning points. You know, those events that make it so life is never the same again. Now, some are positive, others not so much. But life as it was is no more. The day you began to walk as a toddler, that changed the course of your life. The day you started school. If you're married, your first date with your spouse, that was a beginning. First day of a new job, the birth of your first child, and the first day as an empty nester, first day of retirement. Yeah, life is full of those beginning points. And in this episode of the Discover the Word podcast, Bill Crowder is going to lead a study with the group called Jesus Began. I want us to think about beginnings this week because I want us to look at a phrase that repeats itself in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's a phrase, Jesus began. That's the phrase that kind of keeps popping up in one form or another that I think gives us movement and pulls us through the story that Matthew's telling. And so join the Discover the Word group as they look at some of those significant beginnings and the new that those beginnings signal that Jesus was initiating. Jesus Began. That's our study on this edition of the Discover the Word podcast. And it is good to have you here as we get set to begin another hour of studying the Bible together uh, here on Discover the Word. Discover the Word is the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the Scriptures challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. And as I said, this time it is Bill Crowder leading Marty Hahn, Elisa Morgan, and Daniel Ryan Day to the New Testament Gospel of Matthew to discover how, as Matthew tells the story of Jesus' life and ministry and teaching, we're going to find that those two words, Jesus began, will be a helpful key. All right, so let's pull our chairs up to the table with the rest of the group and listen in as Bill gets this conversation started. Okay, so what are some beginning points in life that you've experienced? And you don't have to say birth because that's kind of self-evident, but <laughs> are there some significant beginning points that you reflect on as kind of major milestones in your life? Well, it's good, Bill, because I don't really remember my birth very well anyway, <laughs> but I immediately think of finishing college and getting that first job out of college and feeling like life began in some ways, mm -hmm. even though that's not really accurate because I was living before that, but it felt like a very new chapter of life. Mm -hmm. And it's always mm -hmm. struck me oddly, Daniel, that graduation is really called often commencement, which is instead of graduating, finishing, the focus is on beginning something. Mm -hmm. That is a big one. Yeah, I thought about a couple of things. I thought about my kids, especially in the first day of school. I'm not so old that I can't remember the first day of school myself. But I mean, especially my kids and the sometimes excitement, sometimes trauma that they would come home from that first day of school with all kinds of new experiences and helping them kind of navigate that. And I think of Marlene's and my wedding day. Mm. as a fairly significant beginning point mm -hmm. for us. I just think that beginnings are really important. And I think beginnings are really important because they do become road markers along the way as we reflect on life. And Daniel, I think your example of when you graduated college and started that first job, the new f sense of opportunity and a new start and all kinds of things being very fresh in that kind of experience. I think those are the kind of things that when we look back on, we don't reflect so much on the humdrum days, though there are thousands more of those than there are these critical beginnings. I think we hit those highlights and think about those. And it's so tied into our identity. You know, Daniel, you're talking about starting a new job, and you're talking about Bill getting married, and I'm thinking about my dear, dear friends who are widowed, and the first season of doing life as a single person again. Mm -hmm. So many of the beginnings we're referencing have to do with understanding who we are now, who we are yeah. in this next place. Yeah, they create mm -hmm. new normals, don't they? Mm -hmm. Those beginning points. Now, we've been talking about it on a personal level. Let's talk about it at the level of the scriptures. I mean, the Bible 
is a book of beginnings. I mean, I know we have a book in the Bible that's named Genesis, which means beginnings, and it begins with that very famous statement, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But really, throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, there are all kinds of statements or events that mark new beginning points for the people involved in the story. What are some of those? I can't remember the reference, but it's a prophecy. I think it might be Isaiah, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Mm -hmm. You know, then you got the call of Abram, which was huge, not only for him personally, but for the world, because through Mm -hmm. a descendant of Abram was Mm -hmm. to come one who would bring blessing to all the the families of the earth. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and I think of kind of a a negative dark one, but in Genesis 3, Mm -hmm. you have a beginning of the first time that humans decide to do something different than God's Mm. intention, his ideal. And so there's this new beginning of dealing with things like shame and fear for the first time. A different kind of new normal. We've been thinking about beginnings in a more positive sense, but not all beginnings are positive. Like Mm -hmm. you said, Elisa, you've got friends who have been widowed who are beginning a new kind of life that's not the way they would prefer to have it, probably. And I think that that's true with some of these new beginnings that we see in the Bible, too. For instance, when Israel is taken into captivity in Babylon, that began a 70-year period of time in which they were the possessions of another nation. Mm -hmm. And that was not an altogether positive experience for them. It'd be a time of doubts, I would think. They're probably trying to figure out what in the world happened to God's promise to care for us and to protect us. Yeah. Yeah. In the New Testament, there are beginning points too. Mm -hmm. The most obvious of those is John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. Yeah. And that reflects the in the beginning of Genesis 1, but in a very different way. It takes us back behind creation to who Christ was before he came into the world. It's really striking, isn't it? The way John just parallels those Mm -hmm. first words of the Mm -hmm. first book. Yeah, and color me crazy, I just don't think that's a coincidence. I think there was intentionality there. I think that's exactly what he was trying to do. Daryl Bach, the scholar and theologian who's been with us a number of times on the program, has said that the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are about starting here on the earth. So Matthew starts with a genealogy. Mark starts with Jesus's baptism. Luke starts with the birth narrative. So they start on earth. John's gospel starts in heaven. (laughs) And it gives it a very different feel throughout. But he launches that with that statement, in the beginning was the word. I want us to think about beginnings this week because I want us to look at a phrase that repeats itself in the Gospel of Matthew. One of the things that we've done a lot on the program together is we've looked for threads of ideas that pull through the scriptures. And I'd like for us to think about what I think is a thread of idea that runs its way through the Gospel of Matthew. And it's a phrase, Jesus began. Or in one case, it's he began, but it's referring to Jesus. And there are three critical moments, one at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, one in the middle of his ministry, and one at the end of his ministry. And I'd like for us to look at those beginning points in Jesus's ministry this week, but to kind of set the table for this conversation, let's think a little bit about the Gospel of Matthew itself. Who do we believe was the primary audience of the Gospel of Matthew? Potentially a Jewish audience. Yeah, and there's good reason to believe that he was writing primarily to a Jewish audience. Starting the book with a Jewish genealogy would immediately get the attention of Jewish people who are looking for a Messiah from the line of David and back, as you said, Mark to Abram. The fact that while Mark explains some Jewish customs that they have, Matthew cites those same things, but he makes no point in trying to explain those things. It just seems as though he's content that his audience understands those things already. And I think you're talking, Bill, about the fact that he'll quote Old Testament scriptures and look at those scriptures in a way you say, what's he thinking of? Yeah. So his Jewish audience must have had a hard time realizing, too, that oh, when Jesus came, he does give a new implication, a new fullness of meaning mm-hmm. to texts that don't even seem like they would mm-hmm. initially be referring to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, Matthew has more Old Testament quotes and references and inferences than any of the other Gospels. And that's another building block in the case of 
that being primarily a Jewish audience. Now, the main structure he uses also mm -hmm. may reflect yeah. a Jewish audience because he builds telling the story of Jesus around five major teaching blocks. Now, why might that be significant? Mm -hmm. It feels like it's a picture of the new Torah, the new instruction that God is bringing. And along with that, not only does it feel like a new teaching or a new instruction from God, but it also includes a fleeing to a Egypt and then coming back from Egypt, which parallels the story of Israel that ended up in Egypt and then ended up leaving Egypt. And so those two are connected. Yeah. Where did you get that idea, Daniel, the relationship to Torah? Yeah. So it's those two pieces together. There's five main teaching blocks in Matthew. And so it's this idea that it parallels the five books of the beginning of the Bible, which also parallels the five main sections of Psalms. But then also it's the other keys with it. So the genealogy plus having to leave and go to Egypt and then coming back from Egypt. And so that would like trigger a Jewish audience's mm -hmm. mind. Oh, I know a story like that. That's the beginnings of our people and when we okay. were in Egypt. And then when we came out of Egypt, we were given this instruction, these five books of the law of Moses. Here in this story, Jesus comes back from Egypt with Joseph and Mary, and then we're handed these five teaching blocks of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I think scholars, I'm not going to say universally, because there's always some person who disagrees, but I think the consensus of opinion among scholars is that those five major teaching blocks are the basic structure of the book of Matthew. Mm -hmm. I think these three beginning points provide movement within that structure. I think it would probably be too much to claim that they are a structure within the structure, but I do think that they provide movement within that structure, pushing the story forward with each one of these things. Now, whether Matthew did it intentionally or not, we have no way of knowing, but I think it's a really interesting thing. And it begins with Matthew 4, verse 17. Elisa, would you read that? You bet. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, the little phrase Jesus began, we'll look in our next conversation at Matthew 4, 17, but that's the phrase that kind of keeps popping up in one form or another that I think gives us movement and pulls us through the story that Matthew's telling. And we'll get into it specifically with Matthew 4, 17 in our next conversation. It seems like in almost every avenue of life, there's something to be said for getting off to a good start. Hmm. We talk a lot, especially those of us who are more experienced in life, which translates to older. Yeah, old, old, uh, old, we, yeah. <laughs> we talk a lot about finishing well, but there's also something mm. to be said for starting well, isn't there? I think about a foot race or a swim race and all the false starts that can occur and how we have to come right back and start again, because if one of the competitors gets kind of an unfair advantage, it distorts the race itself. Yeah. So we need to have a good start. It's a pretty overwhelming idea, though, Bill, when you suggest that just in life, we need to make a good I mean, early on, we have nothing to do with our good start, yeah. right? And then we soon start to make all kinds of messes. <laughs> and so maybe the good start is cleaning up the messes so <laughs> we can start again, you know? Mm. Now, I hear what you're saying. I think maybe more specifically about things like if you're going to be taking a long trip, mm -hmm. if that first flight doesn't leave on time, <laughs> it could throw your whole flight okay. schedule off for the mm -hmm. rest of the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you're driving with young kids and you get stuck in traffic early on, yeah. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, <laughs> psychologically, Physically. you're going to be struggling for the rest of the trip. Yeah. Yeah. Are we there yet? <laughs> we're, we're two minutes from home. We haven't <laughs> yeah, even left. <laughs> um, having a good start can come in really handy. And we started this idea of thinking through beginnings yesterday, especially as it relates to the Gospel of Matthew and this little phrase, Jesus began or he began referring to Jesus. And we want to start by looking at the first of these strategic beginning points. And it takes place at the very beginning, which is appropriate, I suppose, <laughs> of Jesus' public ministry. It's Matthew 4, verse 17. Daniel, could you read that for us? Sure. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So at that time, Jesus began to preach. Jesus began. This is actually his first public endeavor in ministry in Matthew's gospel. Mm -hmm. I've read a lot of commentaries and things where, generally speaking, people kind of refer to the Sermon on the Mount as the beginning of Jesus's ministry, but that's chapter five, and here it is in chapter four, and he's already doing ministry, and, Mm -hmm. and this is just the first of several beginning points found right here in Matthew chapter 4. Before we look at those, what's kind of the context that comes before Matthew 4, 17? Well, he's been baptized and he's been in the wilderness being tempted. Mm -hmm. Matthew cites an extended prophecy from Isaiah that Mm -hmm. he is claiming Jesus fulfills. And then comes this statement that Jesus began to preach. And that Mm -hmm. starts a series of dominoes ticking over. What are the implications that will come out of that? Well, I think part of the implications that come out of that is that everything has to start somewhere, and his public ministry starts here. And it starts with these first messages about the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is significant, because we talked in our previous discussion about Matthew primarily being written to a Jewish audience. What would the kingdom of heaven had said to that Jewish audience? So it's the rule and the reign of God. And Mm -hmm. so Jesus saying that the kingdom of heaven has come near means that this rule and reign of God is beginning on earth. It very quietly and kind of veiledly saying, I'm it. You know, I'm the Messiah, but nobody could hear that. But that's really what he's saying. Repent, the kingdom Mm -hmm. is here. Hello, the king is here. So Elisa, you're saying that people really have been anticipating this for a long time. Yeah. And he's going, open your eyes, here we go. But nobody could see. And I think also from Matthew's purpose, when Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven, as Daniel said, the rule of God, Matthew uses heaven in place of God, whereas the other gospels use kingdom of God more Mm -hmm. often. And that's because the Jewish audience had such high reverence for the name of God. They would use heaven as a way to speak of God without having to invoke his name. So kingdom of heaven, kingdom meaning rule, the rule and reign of God, Jesus is announcing it's here. The reign of God is with us because now God is with us in the person of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Does the fact, Bill, that he combines that with repent, would that have put people back on their heels? Mm. I don't think so. Hmm. I mean, obviously, I don't have any way to know for sure, but it would seem to me that they've been hearing a message of repentance from John the Baptist prior to this. So this would not be a new thing for them to hear in that sense. They're just hearing it from a different voice. Okay. Yeah, and even before John the Baptist, that's a primary theme in the prophets, which are the last mm-hmm. collections of what they've heard from God in the mm-hmm. past. And so mm-hmm. this idea of repenting and turning away from the things that have pulled them away from God toward God to find true life and meaning and purpose and all mm-hmm. that is a theme from the Old Testament too. But it was a theme that didn't go over very well with everybody. I mean, <laughs> no. the religious leaders were offended by it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but again, the religious leaders had a totally different worldview than the common people, and the common people were drawn to Jesus. And apparently his message resonated with them very clearly Mm because they start making up big crowds. In fact, following his beginning of preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he begins to assemble his first disciples, his first followers. And then he began to validate that presence of the rule of God message by performing miraculous deeds. All of this is in chapter four before we even get to chapter five. If you came into chapter five and the Sermon on the Mount cold and it said there were great crowds following him, you'd have to ask the question, why? Okay. Why are those crowds following? Well, he's been preaching. He's been doing miracles. He's been assembling followers. And all of this is beginning to attract a huge amount of attention at this kind of the official launch of his public ministry. And I think the phrase public ministry is going to become really important in our next conversation because with the miracles and things like that, there were a lot of reasons why Jesus did miracles, it seems. Obviously, he did them to help people. He did them to respond to human need, but also he did them as evidence of who he was. I mean, part of those messianic prophecies that you were talking about earlier, Mark, those messianic prophecies talked about when Messiah comes, the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. And Jesus starts actually doing this stuff so that in this launching of his public ministry, a part of it 
is declaring the kingdom of heaven is present among you, and then he proves it by these things that he's doing. Okay, so without the miracles, there probably would not have been any crowds, right? Hmm. He could have said all the words about repent. Well, it may have been a different kind of crowd, (laughs) maybe more of a cerebral crowd, if you will. But, you know, it's like he appealed to every part of humankind. I mean, you either were attracted to him because of your emotional or physical or mental need, or you were repelled, you know, by what he was saying. Hardly anybody had no response. Yeah, and I would just say, keep in mind, Mart, that we're not told that John the Baptist worked any miracles, but he was attracting big crowds, too. Interesting. I I think what we know about that point in Israel's history is that they were desperate times, and desperate times drive people to looking for help outside themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they really wanted to hear from the Lord. And, Mm -hmm. you know, before this is considered the silent years Mm -hmm. where God hasn't spoken in some revelation-type way. So they deeply desired that. And going back, I think, Mart, your question's a really important one, which is why does it matter that these are the first words that Jesus basically preaches publicly. As I've been thinking about that in our conversation, it's a really succinct sermon (laughs) that Jesus preaches. It's only a few words. And as we go through the rest of the book of Matthew and we read Mark and Luke and John and then Paul and all of these other writers and all the other words that Jesus says, it's easy to get lost in what the real message is or what we should be thinking about. And so to me, it kind of feels like a gift here at the beginning Mm. that we have this super succinct message from Mm. Jesus, which is, hey, as you're listening to everything else that happens, this is the nugget. This is the core part, which is repent for the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. God is coming as he promised he would. And I'm the representative of that in the world. So that brings me comfort. I think also we see this theme of kingdom and kingship woven throughout the gospels, even to the point where the soldiers mock Jesus saying, hail king of the Jews. That theme of Jesus as the king of a kingdom is one that Matthew really spends time with and lives with. And it was a theme that was very important to the Jewish people. So I think this idea of this very brief, succinct message, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What are you going to do about that? That becomes really important to that audience. An important message for that Jewish audience that Matthew likely had in mind as he wrote. But an important question for us as well. What will we do with how Jesus began his ministry, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Well, you're listening to Discover the Word, and you're at the table with Marty Hahn, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day. And next, the group will discover another time this phrase, Jesus began, appears in the Gospel of Matthew, and it marks a significant turning point in how Jesus talked about how he was going to usher this kingdom in. And the location that he took the disciples to to tell them this was really important. So next time Matthew says Jesus began, that comes up after we take time for a quick break and a word about another resource from Our Daily Bread Ministries. Well, Discover the Word is part of Our Daily Bread Ministries, and we have a lot of resources that we hope you'll take advantage of. For example, there's the classic Our Daily Bread devotional, used by millions around the world for their moments of quiet reflection on their relationship with God. And now, Our Daily Bread is offering free daily video devotionals delivered to your email inbox. They're not the same as the devotional booklet, We've enlisted a great group of presenters that offer perspective and encouragement and advice for making your relationship with God a priority. Those presenters include Elisa and Bill and Daniel and Rasul Berry from our Discover the Word team. And there are quite a few others as well. Some you may recognize, some you may not. But these quick videos offer comfort, encouragement, challenge, and a deeper understanding of your faith. They'll come to you each morning in an email link And so I hope you'll subscribe to receive the Our Daily Bread daily video devotionals. I think they will strengthen your faith 
increase your hope, and inspire you to walk more closely with the Lord. So go online to discovertheword.org and sign up today. And now, the next time we read that Jesus began in the Gospel of Matthew. I'm sure that you're probably familiar with the expression turning point. What is a turning point? It's that moment in the game when (laughs) one team is winning and the quarterback throws an interception, goes back for a touchdown, and then the other team's winning. And from that (laughs) point forward, the other team wins the game. Okay. That's where I most often hear it used. (laughs) In every game, there's a turning point where everything shifts based on usually one play. And sometimes one play is all it takes to determine the outcome of a game. Yeah. And it can happen in every part of our lives, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You think in in school, in in education, it can be one teacher that really all of a sudden helps Mm -hmm. you to think for yourself Mm -hmm. and gives you a whole new approach to your interest. Yeah. You know, the first example that you gave is, you know, about a momentum shift kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But the second example is really almost like an epiphany. There is a waking up, a discovery element Mm -hmm. To mm-hmm. where everything's different. It's like having, you know, mm-hmm. scales fall off your eyes if you're the Apostle yeah. Paul and you recognize Jesus for the first time. Mm-hmm. There is both momentum shift and discovery in the concept mm-hmm. of turning point. That's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a turning point, the Merriam Webster dictionary defines it as a point at which a significant change occurs. And I think that might be a very under strength definition because turning mm-hmm. points seem to me to be far more transformative than that. Uh-huh. There, there's almost a point to where, after a significant turning point, there's a sense in which life is never going to be the same again mm-hmm. because of this huge shift that's mm-hmm. taken place. And I want us, to, in our conversation this time, to think about what I consider to be a major turning point in Jesus's ministry. And we'll talk about why that might be the case mm-hmm. as we get into it. But in our last conversation, we talked about Jesus began to preach. And when did he do that? At the very beginning of his ministry. At the very beginning of his ministry. Mm -hmm. Now we come to Matthew 16, and we come to where scholars believe we're generally in the middle of Jesus's ministry. And this turning point happens at a place called Caesarea Philippi. Anybody know anything about Caesarea Philippi? I think it's one of the most underrated locations in the Gospels. It's up in the north of Israel, isn't it, along the Mm -hmm. border with Lebanon Mm -hmm. today? Yeah, it's actually at the base of Mount Hermon, Hmm. which is snow-capped year-round, and the headwaters of the Jordan River come out of Mount Hermon at Caesarea Philippi, and that's all the fresh water source for all of Israel. But Jesus' ministry that we saw him begin yesterday with a kingdom message and healings and gathering disciples, it's going to take a major shift Hmm. at Caesarea Philippi. Now, what happens at Caesarea Philippi that prompts all this? The top of this chapter on 16 says the demand for a sign. People are Mm. wanting Jesus to prove to be who he says he is. And in response to that, Jesus takes his disciples. He marches them what would have taken several days from the Galilee up to Caesarea Philippi. And there he asks them two questions and then he marches them back. So when I say underrated, there's something significant (laughs) enough about that location that made Jesus feel like the best place to ask those two questions was there, and he was willing to invest about a week to make that happen. So what is it? (laughs) You got me on the edge of my chair now. Why? Well, Caesarea Philippi had been developed as kind of a rest and recreation area for the Roman troops who hated being billeted in Judea. It was hot. It wasn't at all like Italy or Rome. It wasn't at all like other places in the empire. It was kind of the worst place to be. And there's also all of the religious and political pressures because the Jewish people had so many rules that almost everything about Mm. Roman religion violated. Mm. And so there were a lot of pressure points on the Roman troops there in Jerusalem. So they developed this R&R area where they had places selling Roman food. They had temples for the worship of Diana. They had all of the gods of Rome assembled there. You go there today and there's a cliff face with a grotto, which they said is similar to the grotto of the god Pan. And in that cliff face, there are all niches carved out of that where they had gods that the Roman soldiers could come and they could freely worship their gods there without the pressures of the religion of Israel and Judea. So 
it's against that backdrop of all of the gods of Rome, all the gods of the world, in a sense, that Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Mm. And then after Mm. he gets the answer, then he turns to his disciples and says, who do you say that I am? Mm. Standing that at the backdrop of all these other gods and all these other options. With the backdrop of all the gods of the world, who do you say that I am? Mm. Here are your options. And in a sense, when he says, who do the people say that I am? He's asking them what the Jewish options are. And they cite Jeremiah, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Elijah, one of the prophets, you know, these different people. But then when he says Rome, he brings in the gods of the world. And it's almost like, okay, it's time to plant your flag. Who do you say that I am? And what did Peter respond? Yeah, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Yeah, you're the Christ, Messiah, anointed one, the son of the living God, which is a remarkable statement for Peter to make. Mm -hmm. Now... In our last conversation, we talked about Jesus began doing his ministry. He began preaching, but he also began working miracles. And we saw that part of the reason for that was what? To prove who he was. Yeah, to validate Mm -hmm. his identity. Now, it's about a year and a half later. They've been watching and listening to Jesus 24-7 for about a year and a half. And they come to Caesarea Philippi, and Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's almost like, okay, mission 1A has been accomplished. Okay, but Bill, didn't they, like the first time John the baptizer referred to Jesus, there was that sense of anticipation, we found the Messiah. I mean, that's the word that went out. Those first disciples were talking to themselves, we found him, Mm -hmm. we found the Messiah. So that idea had really been around from the beginning of that year or that year and a half that you're referring to. Yeah, it had been around, but I don't think that it had been declared with the sense of clarity and apparent commitment that Peter makes when he makes that very dramatic statement against that backdrop of all those options. That becomes the turning point that I think we need to see because I want you to drop down to verse 21. Mark, could you read verse 21 for us? Sure. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. That is the first time Jesus says anything about his ultimate mission of cross and resurrection. And what I would suggest to you is that until they've come to the true conclusion of who he is, they can't begin to understand why he came. It almost seems like that blows out of the water, the whole idea that they've been waiting for the deliverer, and now he says he's going to die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That had to throw them out. Absolutely, think. yeah. I think almost everything Jesus said had to throw <laughs> <Right>. them because <laughs> we read it 2,000 years later, standing on the shoulders of 2,000 years of scholarship, and it throws us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think these guys, their heads had to be spinning almost constantly. And I don't say that in a negative way about them. I just think that's probably the reality of what it was living in the presence of the I am. Mm. It just had to have been overwhelming. And maybe that's part of why Peter's declaration felt different in this moment with Mm -hmm. Jesus Mm -hmm. is because in the past they were saying, hey, we found him, we found him. And then a year and a half of like, did we find him? (laughs) thought we found him, but he's not doing the things we expect. Uh And then they get to this moment and Peter has this moment of jaw drop. This this really is him. And then to your point, Mark, Jesus starts saying things again that I wonder if Peter and his buddies started going, wait a second. Is he the one again? Yeah. I, I know I just said he was, but he's saying things that he's not supposed to say now. <laughs> Bill, as yeah. you pointed out, if he's the one, he would be the one in contrast to all these false gods, mm-hmm. uh, to the idols, yeah. right? Right, mm-hmm. right. And I think that because he is in contrast to that, Peter's words in that setting take on such great significance. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what makes this a turning point, because up to this point, The way Matthew tells Jesus' story, Jesus' ministry has primarily been public with the crowds and preaching about the kingdom of heaven and parables and things of that nature about the kingdom. From this point on, even though he'll still have public interaction with the crowds, there's a significant shift in his ministry that is more private and with the disciples. And this statement that you read for us, Mark, where Jesus began to unpack the real purpose of his coming in his coming suffering. This is the first of three times that he's going to explain that to his disciples. 
So turning point, I think, is a good way to describe Matthew 16 because he goes from public to private, from the crowds to the disciples, and from the kingdom to the cross. Because troubles and difficulties in life are such a common thing, it's not surprising that there's been an awful lot of music written about dealing with trouble, not only in the Christian world, but secular music as well. What are some songs that you think of when you think about songs that talk about navigating the troubles of life? You know, I, I think of that old spiritual, nobody knows, you know, oh, that's the a troubles I've seen. Yeah. I remember from years ago, Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water, uh, which is a song that's looking for hope mm-hmm. in the middle of a really dark season. Mm-hmm. And then on the Christian side, one of my favorite all-time songs was Andre Crouch's Through It All. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've yeah. learned to trust in God. I, just a great, mm-hmm. great song. Well, trouble obviously is a fairly universal thing <laughs> among humans. And so the last few years, I think, have been fairly troubling for our planet, mm-hmm. in other ways for our nation, in other ways for us in our families and individually. When you're going through a time of trouble, whether it's on a global scale, maybe even more so when it's on a personal scale, how does that affect your view of the future? Sometimes I don't even think about the future. Sometimes it's just focused on how do I get through today or get through mm. the next hour or the next few minutes, depending on yeah. what the issue is. Exactly. So it's consuming until we can look back on it. Mm-hmm. And then depending on what happened in the middle of that trouble, it can give us either a sense of hope for the future. Mm-hmm. If we really sense that a provision was made for us in those difficult moments, and we even sense the presence of God. And then going forward, that allows us to live with a sense of, of more hope. Mm. I want to be careful in how I say this, that we want to leapfrog over the trouble yeah. to the next. We want to live in the future of, oh, it's going to all be better when, and you, mm, you fill in yeah. the blank, and you can be not present in the trouble yeah. in a way. We're a complicated point. people, aren't we? Yeah. yeah, and then in those situations when you think the future is going to get better, but then the future keeps yeah. getting pushed back and yeah. pushed back and pushed back, mm. that can end up getting you to a very bleak, yeah. discouraged, yeah. Yeah. depressing state. I think sometimes that's the way troubles are. They have longer legs than we ever imagined they could. And sometimes they really do permanently shift. We've had conversations about turning points. Sometimes they yeah. do shift us to a whole new normal that we weren't yeah. anticipating. Yeah. Many of us suffered great loss over the last couple of years. And that means that in some ways life is never going to be the same again because of those losses. And dealing with those losses recurs every time you come to a major milestone mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because you remember who's not there anymore. Mm-hmm. And it's hard. We've been looking in our conversations this time at this movement through the Gospel of Matthew is what I'm referring to it as, a movement based on the idea of Jesus's beginnings. We saw in Matthew 4, verse 17, Jesus began to preach this message of repentance and the kingdom of heaven. And then about a year and a half later, Jesus began to explain to his disciples of his true mission, which was to suffer, to go to the cross, and to rise again the third day. Mm -hmm. So we've moved from the beginning of Jesus's ministry to the middle. And now for this conversation, I want us to move to the end. And once again, we get that phrase only here. Matthew doesn't say Jesus began. It says he began referring to Jesus. So just so we're clear on that, Daniel, if you would, to read Matthew 26, Verses 36 and 37, if you would do that for me. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Yeah, this is the third beginning point, and here he's beginning his sufferings. And the beginning of the sufferings is emotional. The words that he began to be grieved and distressed, that's what it is in my translation, grieved and distressed. He began to be troubled and deeply sorrowful, is another Mm -hmm. translation. Jesus began to experience some emotional 
things that apparently were pretty new to him. Mm. It seems that way anyway. And yet, Bill, we know parts of the story that couldn't have been the beginning of his suffering or his groaning. I mean, when he lost Lazarus, remember, and the sisters were yeah. crying and he cried. Yeah. And then other times he cried over Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I guess what I'm saying, Mart, is here, he's beginning to experience these things at a level of anguish that really begins moving him toward the real sufferings of cross and floggings and beatings and all those horrible things that are done to him. That he'd been anticipating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a true expression of the tug of war. I mean, Mm -hmm. Jesus was fully human and fully God. I think, Bill, this is the place where we see his personal battle on this topic of the cross and suffering. And potentially separation from his father, you know, whereas it's mind boggling for us to try and enter this kind of sorrow. Yeah. And I think the fact that this is different than those other episodes of grief and sorrow that he must have had, and that at times we're told that he had, Mm -hmm. the fact that it's different is evidenced by the fact that in Luke's gospel, he begins to sweat drops of blood and an angel has to come and strengthen him. Yeah for what lies ahead. It goes on and says he's overwhelmed to the point of death. Yeah, this is Mm -hmm. extreme. Yeah. And I liked what you said, Elisa, about the coming isolation from his father in a way that to us is mysterious. We can't begin to understand it. But when you get to the words that Matthew uses, grieved is sorrowful, distressed, is a really interesting word. G. Campbell Morgan, I've commented on him before on the program. He's one of my favorite Bible teachers. And G. Campbell Morgan said that this word for distressed, he said, is a really hard word to nail down etymologically as far as its root and stuff. He says it most likely comes from the Greek root that means away from home. Mm. His takeaway from that is that's because it speaks of someone experiencing desolating loneliness and absolute isolation. Mm-hmm. And that is staggering to think about. I've heard grief expressed as homesickness for God, homesickness mm. for our real mm. home. That mm. kind of echoes that, Bill. That's, wow, that's mm. really rich. And he left mm. his mother behind. He left his mm-hmm. disciples behind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he felt fully relationally isolated at this point, too, because he asked the disciples to be with him in this moment. But we get the sense from the story that they're having a hard time being with him in this moment. And so he seems to be suffering Mm -hmm. in that way as well without any community around him to encourage or be with or whatever in this Mm -hmm. moment. And that's before they ran away and Peter Mm -hmm. denied ever knowing him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's interesting is he takes Peter, James, and John with him a little further than the rest. And I've read a lot of different opinions as to why Jesus took the three of them. And some say it's because they were the inner circle. They were his most trusted. Some say it's because they were the ones that Jesus had invested the most in and he wanted them to witness this. G. Campbell Morgan again said, perhaps Jesus took Peter, James, and John because they were the weakest of the disciples. And he felt like they needed to be close to him at this time in a way that the others didn't need the same wow. way. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Do, do you buy that? Sometimes. <laughs> 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 Sometimes. There are times when that makes a lot of sense to me just because we see, as you said, Mark, that Peter's going to deny Jesus, deny ever knowing him. After being in the garden with him, even into that further part where Jesus was praying, I think Jesus knew full well who these guys Mm. were and what they were made of and what they could and could not handle. Mm. Whatever his reasons for bringing them, it was not a casual, offhanded thing. I think there was Mm. great intentionality there that the scriptures don't really describe beyond that. But I do think that there are times when I think, you know what? There's some of that that makes a little bit of sense. You got the Sons of Thunder, mm-hmm. and you got Peter, the really mm-hmm. amorphous one sometimes, and they kind of have to be drawn in closer <laughs> to have the opportunity, and then they sleep through it and don't even get to witness it really. But in a sense, they actually descend with him deeper. Yeah. <laughs> so, with this experience of isolation, struggle, pain, this really begins the passion sufferings that will lead to the cross. And from this moment on, almost every step, almost every breath of Jesus's 
human experience is filled with suffering of some kind until from the cross he says it's finished and gives up the ghost. It really all kind of starts here at this moment. He began to be sorrowful and greatly distressed. It doesn't seem to be fitting to a king, does it? (laughs) No. And what's going to come after this garden experience is going to be even less fitting to a king. Jesus began. Another time that we find that phrase used in the Gospel of Matthew. This time in chapter 26 as we get close to the crucifixion. Well, the group will wrap up this study about some of the beginnings that played a part in Jesus' ministry. And in that closing segment, they're going to note that beginnings are super important, as we've discovered. But finishing is pretty important, too. And so they'll talk about how when Jesus started something... He followed it through to completion, and God is still in that business today. Uh, They'll do that after this preview of our next study, uh, what you may find to be a surprising, disturbing comment that Jesus made. When we get together for the next Discover the Word podcast, uh, you're going to wonder, did Jesus really say that? Does Jesus really want me to hate my family. I'm going to read a verse for us. Uh, This is Luke chapter 14, verse 26. This is Jesus speaking. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. How do you feel about that? (laughs) That's That's hard to swallow, isn't it? That's That's tough. That's a tough one. It's a very contorted command. Something else has to be going on in the background. There's got to be another explanation, right? And so we're going to have to live with the tension of, does Jesus really want me uh, to hate my family? And just remember, okay, there's something else going on here. There's a bigger story unfolding. What is that bigger story? And how does that help us as we walk into some of these really uncomfortable passages together? Yeah. Does Jesus really want me to hate my family? Don't miss the next Discover the Word podcast. And now the conclusion of our study in the Gospel of Matthew called Jesus Began. In our conversations this time around, we've been looking at these really critical strategic moments in Jesus' ministry as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. And we've been wrapping them around this phrase that keeps repeating Jesus began, or he, referring to Jesus, began. So what have we seen so far? At the beginning of his ministry, he began to preach. And I think Daniel pointed out it was just a sentence, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand from Matthew 4. It's kind of a succinct summation Mm -hmm. of his whole life. And I think in the last conversation, Bill, wasn't it then you started talking about these as turning points? Mm. They're beginnings, but they were turning points. Mm. Mm -hmm. Especially at Caesarea Philippi. That seems to be the point where there's a dramatic shift in the focus of Jesus' ministry. Away from the public, more private, away from the crowds, more to the disciples, away from the kingdom message, and more to what we would consider more of a gospel message, if I could put it that way. Yeah, and that's what it says there that you showed us was that he began to unpack to them that the cross is coming and that he's going to have to suffer and die and then three days later be Mm -hmm. raised. So early on he talks about the king is here, at least that's the implication, and then it's but the king's going to die. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the king's going to be rejected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we see that rejection beginning in Gethsemane in our last conversation yeah. when he began to be grieved and distressed. Very emotion-packed words. Now, as we've been going through this, I've heard Elisa saying in her head a thousand times, <laughs> okay, so what? And I don't say that in any way pejoratively, Elisa. I know you're always looking for a way to help our listeners have some kind of grab to take away. And I think the significance is Jesus began, Jesus began, Jesus began so that we could have an opportunity at a beginning. I think that's the so what. That's the big deal. Through his cross and then three days later, the resurrection, he was making everything new. Mm -hmm. And I'd like for us in the so what portion of our conversations 
to think about some of those new things that we have a beginning with because of Jesus's perseverance through his ministry. All of that was moving somewhere. And at some level, even though I can't say it was exclusively for me, at some level, it was for me. Mm. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah. And I think, though, Bill, in our conversations, as you've led us, I think we ended up seeing not only great drama in each of these new beginnings, but there was something of great significance as far as Mm -hmm. the kind of story that the king was telling us to get us to this point of new beginnings. Yeah, and I think where we saw that come out most clearly, Mark, was at Caesarea Philippi when Peter declares, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then Jesus says, yep, you're right, but... It's not going to end the way you want it to. Mm -hmm. And that's when he starts explaining the gospel mission in that sense. I think as hard as it is for us to understand some of the things that Jesus said, I just think it must have been so difficult for the disciples. Their image of what the Messiah King was going to look like was a whole lot more like Judas Maccabees Mm -hmm. than Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Judas Maccabees came on the scene, he and his brothers, Judas the Hammer, came on the scenes with his brothers when the Assyrians had come through, they had ravaged the land. And you have this kind of motley crew of rebels and renegades who drive this huge army out of the land and restore Israel to a place as a freestanding nation. And now under Rome's oppression, that's the kind of Messiah that people are looking for, one that would look more like Judas Maccabees. And was he before Jesus or after Jesus? Yeah, he was about 150 years before. So they would have that image in their mind, that expectation. Okay. That was very fresh in their national memory. I already feel convicted just hearing that because I think of how often... The way God and his judgment has been described to me makes him sound much more like God the hammer than Jesus the Christ who came and laid down his life for the world. So if nothing else, maybe part of the new beginning that we see there for us is not taking for granted all that we've heard and learned and being open to new beginnings and even our understanding of who Jesus is. Because I have a feeling that we're a lot more like the disciples and what our expectations of who God is and how he should act. And I think we might be surprised at times at how Mm. different Jesus really is. We need to keep relearning that, don't we, Daniel? Just over and over again. Mm -hmm. That our own expectation of what he's doing in our lives keeps doing something new, but we don't necessarily see where it's going. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of we walk by faith and not by sight, right? Mm. I mean, we walk in our best moments trusting him without all the answers. In our worst moments, we walk asking a lot of questions and demanding the kind of answers that we think are Mm -hmm. what we want. Right. When Jesus accomplished his work on the cross and the resurrection, it offered this opportunity to make everything new. And some of those things are for now. Some of those things are for later. So what would be some of the things that are for now? I think about we're born again. We have a new birth. We're new in him. And the old has passed away and the new has come. I love that Mm. statement of hope that I am, you are, we all are being transformed. Yeah. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Many of us who reflect on what our lives were before we met Christ, no matter how much of a mess we might be now, we should be able to tell a fairly good difference between what our life was before Christ and what it is now, because there should be some evidence of newness somewhere, I think. Right. And maybe even if it's that we keep messing up in similar ways, the awareness that we're messing up alone <laughs> yeah. is a newness. Right. Yeah. Those would be the for now new things. What would be the for later new things? Suffering and death. Mm-hmm. Those have been defeated by the cross and Jesus rising again, but we still experience them in very real ways in this Mm -hmm. world. And yet the promise that we look to is the fact that suffering and death will one day pass away. Mm -hmm. It's a new hope, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems to me too, that even though we've heard all of our lives that God is love, there's a sense in which coming back to the cross and seeing Jesus in his suffering as King It seems like it leads deeper and deeper into an awareness of God's love that is so far beyond Mm -hmm. his caring for us, his Mm -hmm. caring for the world that is so much 
greater than even in this moment we can begin to conceive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To me, that is the newest new, is for us to experience a kind of love that not only was unavailable to us apart from Jesus, it would have been completely foreign to us mm-hmm. because of the degree to which God was willing to go to express just That's how good. much he loved us. This mm-hmm. new love that we have been given through Jesus, it does start to overwhelm you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's why we don't think about it as much as we should, because we don't like feeling overwhelmed. But mm-hmm. I know for me, if I really take Isaac Watts seriously and I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, the only way I can look at that cross and see it as wondrous is because of the love that's being expressed mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. I love this application of what the beginnings Jesus provided in the back of my mind is bubbling up a new question. And that is, how is Jesus like a beginner? How is he a completer? Mm -hmm. What are the finishings that he did? Because I'm laying, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning Mm -hmm. and the end on top of this. Jesus absolutely began, but he also finished. It is finished, that work. That's a really good echo, Elisa. Uh, He is the author and completer of our faith. Mm -hmm. And his statement from the cross, it is finished, te telestai, was a statement that was used in the ancient world in a variety of different ways. It was used when an artist completed a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. It was used by bookkeepers for when an account had been paid in full. Mm -hmm. All of these ramifications of what Jesus finished when he took our sin on himself and became our sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That completion is really what makes the, our new beginnings possible. Mm. Mm. There's a part of me that doesn't want to give about the thought either that those beginnings, they'll continue in the life to come. Mm-hmm. You know, he mm-hmm. completed what he did for mm-hmm. our rescue and to reveal the nature of his Father's heart to us. But it really is for those new beginnings that will continue on into the life to come. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love the statement in Lamentations that his mercies are new every morning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's just for this life, Mart. I mm-hmm. think that's forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think all throughout eternity, we're gonna keep discovering and rediscovering things about our God and his love for us that are gonna blow our minds for all eternity. Yeah, and I'm reminded of the passage that takes so much pressure off of us in some ways because it's he who began a good work in you (laughs) is the one who will complete it. That's awesome. Yeah, that really is awesome, isn't it? Jesus began our focus on this edition of the Discover the Word podcast, but we ended on the note that not only does he begin, which gives us hope for new beginnings, he also completes and finishes as well. Yeah, great conversations based in the Gospel of Matthew. Bill Crowder leading Mark DeHaan, Elisa Morgan, and Daniel Ryan Day. Now, Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. And it's thanks to the financial support from listeners just like you that Our Daily Bread Ministries is able to provide resources like Discover the Word. And just know that your gift, no matter the size, will help us to continue to make the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible accessible to people all around the world in a lot of different ways. Donate online today at discovertheword.org Click on the Donate button at discovertheword.org. You can give safely and securely right there. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.